thanks very much, Katie, and I'm really glad to join you this evening. Thanks for coming out for this, and I think you'll find it uh, very informative and enjoyable, I hope. I know I will, so hopefully you will as well. We're going to talk about a new medicine uh, that uh, transcends the era of Voltaire. So I've had this uh, quote sitting up here for you to kind of <coughs> where medicine is today still. I know you think that's oh. kind of harsh. Oh. Yeah, isn't Scary. it? Scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'll, I mean, I just, I think just actually going through it will help cement where we are. Uh, doctors prescribe medicine of which they know little, to cure diseases of which they know less, and human beings of which they know nothing. Now, I know you think that is off base, but where we're going to go over the next 30 minutes or so will be a uh, whole new era of medicine, which I'm hoping that you will help push forward. Because if you don't do that, it's not going to come too quickly. And uh, the, the book is, uh, really adopts the creative destruction concept that was popularized by the noted Austrian economist, uh, Joseph Schumpeter. You remember uh, he was, uh, those of you who are uh, into economics, he was um, very active in the last century. In fact, in 1911, just 100 some years ago, he published a book of the theory of economic development. And you see this graph which basically depicts the old world and the new world and something big innovation, big uh, in the entrepreneurial space has to happen for a new economy to form. And that's what I'm now trying to apply to medicine is this concept. This is very different than the Clayton Christensen model of disruptive innovation. This takes it to another log order of, uh, of uh, innovation and, and radical uh, transformation. So um, I was, I'm a big fan of Schumpeter, obviously, and uh, my favorite column to read each week is at The Economist, Schumpeter. So just last week, I'm reading the column, and it says, uh, now for some good news. I had no idea what this column was going to be about. It would sound like an interesting title, and it turned out it was a review of this book, <laughs> saying it's a godsend <laughs> for those who suffer from Armageddon fatigue. And I got to tell you, that made my day. You know, that was like, you know, that was fantastic. Okay, so this Schumpeter thing we're going to get into, um, before I do that though, it's basically about digitizing human beings and how that resets the whole way medicine can, can move ahead. But I want to just get a sense of the group here and uh, I want to find out how many of you are active on Twitter. Okay, we got three, three people. Okay, well, what I want to suggest is you need to get on this. <laughs> Because that's where I get all my useful information, okay? And most uh, everything that I'll discuss this evening, I found out first on Twitter, just like we found out that um, Osama bin Laden was going to be killed in Abbottabad through Twitter, you know, many, many hours before the world actually knew about it. And, and the things that happen in medicine and science, and in fact, when an article, a major article, is, almost any significant article is published, it's immediately critiqued on Twitter. And so if you're following a particular thing and you want to know if it's real, the real deal, that's a great way to find out. Okay, so I want to convince you of three things. <laughs> I kind of set the, the table on this. The first is that our world has been shimpatered. The second is that medicine will get shimpatered, just a matter of time. By the way, this is a verb now, kind of like Googled, now that we're in this uh, Google land here. And uh, consumers need to drive this. And that's the most important premise, and that is why I wrote this book because I didn't think that I can work with the medical community anymore. We need to get, you know, the whole uh, uh, public uh, consumer world activated. So let's start off with the digital side of this, the zero one side that um, has had an uh, amazing amount of uh, uh, action in a short period of time. In the last decade, there was um, a couple of things that of note that I think capture this. There are now more cell phones on the planet than there are toilets or toothbrushes, okay? That kind of tells you the, and over 90% of the world's population has a cell phone signal, mobile signal. Uh, and that tells you the kind of uh, digital infrastructure that already exists today. But then the other thing that happened that's really big were these devices. And I'm looking around the room and I'm, I'm very gratified that you're not on your, uh, your smartphone or your iPad. I noticed a lot of you had those before we got started so that I knew you were at least in the digital era from that respect. But these devices that started in zero one, the uh, iPod and then, of course, uh, Blackberry, which then was renamed Crackberry and now more recently Slackberry. <laughs> and then you've got uh, the prototypic smartphone, e-readers, and uh, 
than uh, the tablet. All this happened in the span of nine years. That's an amazing amount of change that took over not just, of course, how we communicate any longer or how we shop or game, or, but even how we behave and how we think. And that's radical. That's, I, I believe, fulfills the definition of uh, creative destruction. And so, in fact, in this week's Economist, uh, this is the article, Slaves to the Smartphone, the Horrors of Hyperconnectivity, and how people feel that they're surgically connected to their phones and have to just be very responsive to anything that's coming through, any transaction that's coming through. And it's gotten to the point where it's not just one um, screen. Now we have to be multiple screens, multiple screens. You've got to have the uh, tablet going on with your, uh, you could be watching television, also with your phone, everything going on at once. And we have a new era, uh, a new species of man, uh, and this is homo distractus, okay? <laughs> and that's what's represented here. Yeah, yeah, that too, but that's homo distractus. Now, this is a phenomenon that starts at a very young age, and I realize that there aren't too many digital natives in this group, maybe one. Um, and uh, this is uh, portraying how young it starts, uh, right here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I thought this was pretty young, actually, you know? But then I came across this one that really captured it. Um, and uh, for those of you who can't see it, it says, Mom keeps uh, tagging me in these pics from my embryo face, so embarrassing. Uh, bro, you got to manage your privacy settings. Okay. so. Um, you know, that's, of course, a little hyperbole, but you get the picture. Um, so now I want to ask you some questions. Uh, and the first question is, I know you'll get this. If you don't, I will fall over. Uh, what was zero in 2004? Zero. And then in 2011 was 800 million. All right, good. I don't have to fall over. Now, why is this so impressive? Well, this is impressive for many reasons, but perhaps the most... Uh, Extraordinary thing is that by August this year, it will exceed 1 billion. It's already about 100, 870 million last count. And soon after that, it will transcend the size of the community of people in China or India. And uh, this is pretty startling. Now, of course, now this is an uh, initial public offering, and it's thought that this company could have a valuation of $100 billion. And all of that, of course, is anchored by this like button and the ability to digitize human beings at a very superficial level in terms of, uh, uh, of affinities for, uh, for retail. And of course, you don't want to wake up in the morning and have no friends like this uh, fellow. And I don't know if all of you, by the way, is anybody here, it's okay to admit it, it's fine. Anybody here not on Facebook? Okay, that's good, okay, interesting. We're gonna get into that a little bit later. These companies are digitizing you every day. All right, and of course, the, the not just the Google searches, but uh, you know, you've got uh, any, not just the Facebook uh, a like button. Any, anything you do with these, the the, ho the four horsemen of our digital infrastructure today, they're digitizing you. And in fact, uh, I don't know if you've seen this article on the Atlantic, but I highly recommend you read it. Uh, this is about the 140 companies that are tracking everything you do on the web. 104, I should say. Um, and, of course, with uh, added to Google. And you probably saw this New York Times Magazine feature article a few weeks ago where Target and retail stores have hired these companies, and they know, for example, when a woman's pregnant well before her family knows that she's pregnant. Hopefully not before she knows, but uh, that's really, uh, it, that kind of gives you a capture of digitizing human beings, but not in the health or medical space. But I thought this cartoon, in fact, I, I got sore looking at this. This is how you protect yourself from being, uh, you know, uh, from Google. I don't know if you've seen this, but it just, I just came across it. And it had some interesting things like play music l loud so they can't um, hear what you're typing. Um, they've got uh, crime scene <laughs> booties to prevent DNA leakage. Uh, you know, unplugged computer from power source. The, the real story is you can't block this. No matter if you take all these crazy uh, precautions, you're being digitized. You know, you can't be on the web without there being, you can do everything. In fact, that article in the Atlantic goes through that you can do everything possible and you're still being digitized, okay? In a way, but we're gonna take that to a, a whole different level. So here's the next question. What was now zero in 2006? 
and then is now well over 300 million per day.